Okay, check one, two. I believe I am live at the moment. What's going on? Let's just see if I can get this working. It's been a long time since I've been live. Looks like I've got a little bit of a delay on my stream. I hope the audio and the visuals are syncing okay. I'm not sure at the moment. You have to let me know if it's working okay. Gotta wait for a few people to join in or at least join the room before I fully commit and we can kind of get going on this topic. Do me a favor if you are online and you can hear me okay, just um, send me a message and let me know that. You can see me and you can hear me okay. Um, I'm hoping it's working okay. Good evening. Mr. Wesker Willie. Am I, am I audible? Am I, am I visual? Am I visible? Am I audible? Let me know. Because I do want to get going. There's a slight echo. That's peculiar. Um, I'm sure I can fix that. Yeah. How's the echo now? Let me know if that's helped the echo. Um, you can hear me, see me okay. You, you can hear me okay. Slight echo. Just let me know if the echo's sorted. Still echoes. That's weird. Um, I wonder if I mute one of these. these how's the echo now has that helped with the echo of it let me know if that's helped with the echo thank you robert thank you very much for the feedback just trying to sort out the audio just let me know if it's still echoing oh i've got a couple more tricks i can try to get rid of the echo because that will get a little bit irritating i'd imagine so let me know by the way, so, uh, um, no. I'm guessing no, is no no echo or no, or no no it hasn't fixed it. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, by the way, it's good to be live again. Um, I haven't been live for a long time, and there's so many different things <laughs> that have been going on. First of all, I, I have suffered a little bit from overload or overwhelm, I should say. Uh, slight slight improvement, still echoes. Okay, cool. Ah, oh dear. Um, I've got one more trick up my sleeve. Let me know if this sorts out. Let me know if that... No, that doesn't work, sorry. I'm not sure if I've got a solution for the echo in, which is a little bit of an annoyance. It might just be down to my delay. But anything, anyway, as I was saying, basically, one of the reasons I haven't been live is because I was slightly overwhelmed with the amount of stuff that I want to do on the channel. Um, so I've kind of been gathering lots of different topic points, doing a lot of research, doing a shed load of reading. I've probably bought about 30 volumes in the last, I don't know, in the last month. I think I've probably bought about 30 books. Um, and, you know, you get hungry um, to kind of get through all those and touch and all the, I fixed it, did I? Did I fix it and then it, oh, no more echo. Okay, I don't know what I did, but all good. Thank you, great, <laughs> superb. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know what I did um, there. But um, yeah, I bought about 30 books and I'm just trying to get on top of all the content that I do want to put out. And then about a week ago, I got a toothache and I think we kind of take for granted when we're in good health and then it takes something to happen, even a really small thing for you to be less than perfect and realize how utterly useless you become um so for the last week i've done absolutely nothing um which is great so, but i'm back now and um i've got a topic that i really want to hit on so i'm not sure how long this is all going to take okay i'm really happy that the echo has been fixed i'm going to put my um webcam back on let me know if, i hope that doesn't cause the echo to flare up a little bit more again um but there you go yeah, so I've got yeah, this topic so got that I want to cover and actually it's, it's a bit of a, it's a weird one and I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey and I'm going to need you guys to stick with me because it's very interesting and 
I think the first comment I could see in the chat, actually, someone said it's it's not beyond the white supremacists to do this. Yeah, not just the white supremacists, the, um, I would say the Arab supremacists like Hawass would do this as well. Um, there's a lot of falsification that takes place in ancient Egypt and it's really sad because what we're, what the general public and what we're presented with tends to be fabrications of the truth and tends not to be the truth and there's so many different layers that I want to touch on this topic on um, but just on the, the very top layer that people have a perception of what ancient Egy Egyptians look like even we have a perception of what they look like based on what okay so we we everyone kind of who's on this stream or most people who are on this stream or most people who know me um the echo is back i think the echo is down to the visual so you know what i might do because you don't actually need to see me it's not actually adding anything so i'm gonna hide me <laughs> i'm gonna hide me behind a window okay i should have created a nice little title screen that would have been really cool and i think that that will cause the echo to disappear yeah, so like I was saying, I think we have a perception of what the ancient Egyptians look like. And a lot of our perception of what the ancient Egyptians look like is based on the artifacts that we have. And the funny thing is, we've even with the artifacts that we have or that have remained, there's enough evidence for us to know that the ancient Egyptians were definitely an African society. But I always bear in mind that the artifacts that we have in my estimation, are probably about either, I reckon, less than 20% of the artifacts that have been found. In my estimation, I think about 80% of the ancient Egyptian artworks, um, the ancient Egyptian statues, the ancient Egyptian papyrus, um, that show clearly what the ancient Egyptians look like, um, have been either sold off in private auctions or are sitting within the basements of the large museums, such as the um, British Museum and some other ones spread around Europe and America, or they were just outright sabotaged, like quite a, you know quite a majority of them, the ones that at least survived in and remained in Egypt. The you know Egyptian authorities make make sure of the fact that they you know the ones that look too African are sab sabotaged. So it's amazing that even in spite of all of the tampering and destruction that takes place, we're still left with essentially a African looking society. Now, that being said, even though it's 2023, this stream is hopefully going to prove to you that this kind of tampering that takes place, this destruction of comedic artworks is it's not over. It's it's still happening. Um, so I wanted to kind of bring you into bring you into this subject with me because I think it's a really interesting one. Please do, by all means, you know, talk to me in the chat. Make sure you're following along because this is a bit of a it's a bit of a journey I'm going to take you on today. But those of you who um, are kind of subscribed and maybe tuned into my other videos, you'll know that I have a short that's based on the subject of dolichocephaly. Now, dolichocephaly is a bit of a weird subject that you probably wouldn't find yourself, you know, into unless you're, you know, you were a kind of a student of, you know, cran craniometry, basically, and relating that to the contributions of different groups to or different ancient societies to civilization, because that's where the topic actually really gets quite interesting. So... Um, name examples of fakes. I'm not going to do that just yet. Okay. Um, fakes. I don't, I don't think I even mentioned <laughs> fakes. <laughs> I don't think I mentioned fakes at all. Um, I talked about, um, sabotage. Um, so yeah, please do stay tuned and we'll, you know, you'll, you'll get all of that knowledge. So the subject of dolichocephaly, I'm going to kind of take you through this cause it's quite important. We understand this together. So Cephalic index, first of all, we all understand what this is. And please stick with me because this does get really interesting. It's quite a technical subject, but I want you to stick with me because it gets interesting. First of all, what is your cephalic index? Your cephalic index is essentially a measurement of the length of your skull versus 
the width of your skull. So this is the view of a skull top down. Okay, you can see here. The length will be measured from the front of the forehead to the back of the head. And the width will obviously be measured from the widest point of the skull from top view. Okay, and that will give you a cephalic index. So what you essentially do is you divide the, so you do the width divided by the length and that will give you the cephalic index essentially. Okay, it's a very, it's a very simple calculation. Now there are three types of skulls. So I want you to kind of stay with me on this, yeah? Dolichocephalic, which is a long skull. So when you have a long skull, basically we're talking about the length to width ratio is that it ends up being quite a narrow skull. So you can see here on this example here, we have quite a narrow skull. We then have mesocephalic or mesotisephalic. Now this is kind of a new classification because before you only really had dolichocephalic and brachycephalic, but they've introduced mesotisephalic more recently. And that's kind of like an in-betweeny kind of skull where it's kind of like, you know, neither long nor round, so to speak, or square. It's kind of like sitting in between. And then you have the more square shaped skull over here, which is the brachycephalic or the round skull, they call it, where you can see the length by the width. There's not a huge amount of difference between the length and the width. And that gives you more of your kind of roundish shaped skull from the top or at least square. You can see from the back, it's quite flat. Now, where does this get interesting? Well, when it comes to the subject of dolichocephaly, only Africans exhibit dolichocephaly naturally, okay? It's not something that's naturally exhibited amongst other races. And this is really important to understand. So remember what I talk about quite often, you probably would have seen in my latest documentary that I did, just talking about African phenotypic diversity. Africans tend to not be very restricted in terms of the different ways that we can look. Um, essentially, we can have really dolichocephalic people within our populations. We can have lots of mesotisephalic or mesocephalic people within our populations, and we can have lots of brachycephalic people within our population. And all three of them will be will naturally fit. Um, someone, I think, put in the comments, beanhead, LOL, and you're spot on. <laughs> okay, that's exactly what we call it in the African community. You know, I've heard people call it beanhead, peanut head. There's a few different derivatives of it. Feel free to spam the comments with the different things that we call people who've kind of got that long head. Um, I'm mildly long headed. My son is very long headed. My son is definitely um, dolichocephalic. So it's something that's really common in our populations. OK, and it's just an African trait. However, if you go outside of African populations, particularly to Europeans, dolichocephaly is not normal at all. In fact, let's go this let's go to exhibit two okay so exhibit two is over here okay and no we'll come back to that one later i want to just show you what happens when we google dolichocephaly so if you google dolichocephaly this is just a normal google let's have a read of the definition definition an abnormality of skull shape characterized by an increased anterior posterior diameter. So something that we've just discussed is quite clearly a trait amongst Africans. And I'm gonna show proof of that as well. In fact, if we just go back to this first one that I pulled up, let's have a look at dolichocephaly amongst populations, okay? So let's read here. The dimensions of the human body are affected by biology, ecology, geography, blah, blah, blah. The CI or the cephalic index is measured as the breadth of the skull multiplied by 100 and divided by the length. Cephalic index is classified into three broad categories, dolichocephalic, like I mentioned, mesotisephalic and brachycephalic. Now, here's the important part. Australian and native Southern Africans, now it says Southern Africans, but really this is just their way of saying black Africans or sub-Saharan Africans. But it says native Southern Africans are dolichocephalics. So basically Australians 
and it's talk, obviously not talking about modern Australians, it's talking about Aboriginal Australians, okay? They are dolichocephalics, okay? So black Africans and Papua New Guineans, Polynesians, these are all people who are kind of phenotypically classified as black, you know, Aboriginal Australians. They all come out as dolichocephalic. Chinese European skulls are mesotecephalic and Andaman Islanders are brachycephalic. So this is a little bit of a stretch here and we're going to see why in later. But generally, Europeans are mesotecephalic to brachycephalic and Chinese are extreme brachycephalic. So your average European has a skull in the range and when I say European, I'm talking about a um, non-melanated European, a skull in a range of from here to here. And then most Asians will sit in the brachycephalic range. However, like I mentioned before, just because dolichocephaly is common amongst Africans, it doesn't mean we're restricted to it. As you know, you probably have it within your family that you have some people in your family who are mesocephalic and some people who are strongly dolichocephalic and I'll give you an example here so if we flip over to the Andaman Islanders who are mentioned here these are quote-unquote black people and they are very brachycephalic the backs of their skulls are very flat and they have you know they're basically the width to the length ratio is very very close so they have very kind of square or round skulls from the top but they were phenotypically classified as black even though they're asian i know many of you have come across andaman islands before they are actually you know asians but physically on a physical scale remember when we talk about race we're talking about something that is political not something that actually exists on a kind of physical scale they'll be classified as black people and yet they have square skulls and then they're, they're not the only ones Ghanaian akan people you know, we've got this running joke between Ghanaians and Nigerians. You know, Nigerians will call Ghanaians square heads. They'll call us long heads. It's kind of like a little running joke between the two nations. But Ghanaian Akan people are very strongly brachycephalic people. They have the backs of their skulls are much in general. And obviously I'm speaking generally not here, but it's quite common in Ghana, um, particularly amongst the Akan people, to have quite flat back of the head and quite wide heads. So very brachycephalic skull structures so it's really important to understand that dolichocephaly is not something that africans are restricted to however you must understand it's something that only africans are capable of without it being a disability so i need you to understand that only africans are capable of dolichocephaly without it being classified as a disability OK, and I'm going to just prove that here so that everyone's very clear on that. So we talked about the fact that it's classified as an abnormality of the skull characterized by an increase in the posterior diameter. We can just scroll down what causes dolichocephaly, craniosynostosis, and I want you to remember that word because that's going to come up later, or positioning, i.e., you know, kind of like people's head being kind of clamped. You know, these are two major causes of dolichocephaly amongst, and bear in mind, this is amongst people who are not African. You have a whole wiki page in dolichocephaly where it shows that it's a disability amongst the Europeans. They're not capable of dolichocephaly unless it's a disability. So it's really important that we kind of understand that distinction. And by the way, whilst we're on this topic, this is something that is really important for us to understand. When it comes to features that Africans have that are widespread, that Europeans don't possess, this they will always, and this is a rule of thumb, they will always classify our features as disabilities. You must be aware of that, okay? They will always classify features that are unique to black people. I've got a whole video that I want to do on this. I'll probably do another live stream. Features that are unique to black people that they don't share, they will always classify as a disability. So it's a it's a very common trick they play. So for instance, I think I spoke up spoke about before, I think it was on a live stream actually, the fact that subnasal prognathism, where the lower part of your face kind of protrudes out further than the upper part of your face, this is very common. In fact, I would say 
you know, it's probably 50, maybe 60, 40. If you're a black African, you're going to be prognathic or have subnasal, subnasal prognathism to some degree. That's classified as a disability because Europeans do not possess that trait. They, have, they don't have the ability to have subnasal prognathism. So they call it Habsburg jaw. Okay. So if I was to type in Habsburg jaw over here, you will see that basically that is their explanation for subnasal prognathism amongst Europeans. Now, here's what's interesting, and this is where it's going to get really, really interesting. So I want you to tune into this next gem that I'm about to drop. Early European royalty and the early European people were all or were largely dolicocephalic and had Habsburg jaw. Okay, I want you, I want you to just kind of let that settle. Okay, early European royalty and most early European populations, the people they call pure Aryans, had Habsburg jaw. <laughs> this, which is basically their code code word for subnasal prognathism and dolicocephalic heads. Put that where you like that. You, you know, put that where you want to put that, but. You have to explain that. And when you can't explain that, the only explanation you can do is come up with ridiculous ideas like, well, they were all deformed, like you can see with these images here. Look at all these European royals and monarchs with their deformed faces. The question is, what are they hiding? That is the question. Why? And, 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 the, and the easy and the biggest question to ask is, if all early Europeans were dolicocephalic, what caused them to stop? Why have they suddenly stopped and suddenly become brachycephalic. What happened? Did they stop? Did, what happened to the population? Head shape should be consistent. Okay? It's not long enough for some kind of evolution to take place where the head shapes all suddenly change. You know, that's something that would take, I would imagine, tens if not hundreds of thousands of years for them to gradually become brachycephalic. But for them to instantly, from literally... 2,000 years ago, all be dolicocephalic to modern day, all be brachycephalic. Common sense would tell you that it's not the same set of people. And actually history tells us that it's not even common sense. You just got to read history. But can you understand about the, you know, the, the Caucasian expansion? And you understand about the, you know, the Vandal and Gothic expansion into Europe? You understand, you know, the origins of kind of the modern European so it's quite interesting, but that's not what this entire discussion was about. Okay, that's not what this entire discussion was about. We're going to focus on King Tut, but I just wanted to kind of paint the picture there so everybody's clear and we understand that, first of all, dolicocephaly is a natural African trait. Okay, um, I'm just going to see if I do I have any more sources on dolicocephaly being a natural African trait that I can share. Um... I think so did i find something i just want to see if there's any anything else worth sharing on this you know what I, I, i'll i'll leave i'll come back to that i'll come back to that but it's a natural african trait um and you'll find this in most if you literally just google dolicocephaly in africa you'll find that every article will mention the fact that many africans are naturally dolicocephalic in fact i've got one really good article here let's have a look here so um let's just quickly scroll down bear with me this one talks about ancient egypt i'm going to come on to that in fact let's just broach this subject now because this is probably the most important subject that i want to touch on so this moves on to the ancient egyptians which obviously this is about and the fact that the ancient egyptians were by and large dolicocephalic pretty much all of them across the board okay so if we have a read of this it says would it surprise you that there are a lot of people with dolicocephalic skulls or long heads in africa on a bulletin board someone quoted from 1939 publication by raymond a dart so those of you who have seen my video where i mentioned that 2861 skulls were tested 
or Egyptian skulls, ancient Egyptian or Kemetic skulls were tested and over 95% of them came out dolichocephalic. This was the article that I was quoting, okay? And this guy's an ardent racist, by the way, so he didn't actually turn around and go, well, they're all dolichocephalic, that means they were black. He turned around and said, oh, they're all dolichocephalic, that means they're part of the true Aryan race, the same as the one that was in Europe. <laughs> So that's how deluded these people are. Literally will not have a trace of dolichocephaly in modern Europeans, not a, tr not a trace of it. And yet they are quite happy to claim that the earliest Europeans <laughs> were their ancestors, even though they share no commonality with them. It's a very, very, very bizarre behavior. But anyway, and an Australian anatomist, anatomist and anthropologist who recorded the cephalic index of 2,861 Egyptian skulls spanning the pre-dynastic and all dynasties. Dart was professor of anatomy at the University of Witzwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. And his paper is called Population Fluctuation Over 7,000 Years in Egypt. So you can purchase that paper um, if you're ready to be, you know, <laughs> racially abused, which is essentially what he does. But it doesn't matter because we're here for the, the content or, or at least the research that took place. So here's where it gets interesting. Only 1% of pre-dynastic Egyptian skulls are brachycephalic or round or spherical. El Amra, 1%, 101 skulls. Nagada, 1.9%, 314 skulls. And Al Badiri, 0% out of 79 skulls. From dynasty, so by the way, back then when they were testing skulls, they didn't have this kind of a mesocephalic index, which they've kind of created as a, a bridge, so to speak, so that it's, they don't feel so distant from being able to claim <laughs> comedic societies, etc. Et they just had brachycephalic and dolichocephalic. From dynasty one to dynasty six, brachycephaly does not exceed a single percent. However, during the first intermediary period um, or dynasty nine, 11.6% of skulls are brachycephalic or round. Okay, so there is a intermediary period. So bear in mind that's not intermediary period suggests that these people may not have been indigenous um Kemetic or Egyptian people and you can see that the rate goes up it doesn't shoot up it still suggests that they were the same as other Africans but there's a difference there in other words in ancient Egypt most Egyptians were dolichocephalic or had long heads in 1300 PC we find a well-known family of long skull people as rulers of Egypt Akhenaten and his wife um, and their daughters had clearly very elongated skulls Okay, I want you to remember that. Akhenaten's father and mother are Amenhotep III and his wife, T. The parents of Nefertiti are not known. Now, Akhenaten and Nefertiti were quite different from previous rulers. They always did away with multi-god pantheon. Now, I'm just going to kind of skip ahead because this is all very interesting, but I want us to kind of stick on the topic because otherwise it's going to take ages. All members, so this is really important, Akhenaten lineage. It's very important that you remember this. All members had dolichocephalic or long skulls. Their skull extends way back much further than what we find in the rest of Europe with the dolichocephalic Neolithic people. Much further than what we find in the rest of Europe with the dolichocephalic Neolithic people. Okay, so remember that. Early Europeans, dolichocephalic, yet modern Europeans, not a trace. Explain that. There is some variance in the form of their skull. Their daughters had a longer and more round skull than that of Nefertiti because Akhenaten was always depicted with large headrests or hat. We can only surmise he must have had a very long head too. Um, now, I just want to skip ahead to here. Tutankhamun himself is kind of an oddity. From the moment his tomb was opened, it was clear his skin was black all the way as we're kind of aware of. Um, so one of his parents might have been from black African. Not only was the pharaoh's body black, it was the sub-Saharan type. His dolichocephalic skull, this is King Tut we're talking about, that is typical of East African Nilotic population, peoples indigenous to Nile Valley and Nilotic speakers, especially the Kalenjin and the Maasai. These are the populations whose skulls produce a cephalic index reading between 73 and 75. This is what Tutu could 
Tutankhamun's bust exhibits the 73 to 75% manifest in modern East African populations. Okay, now, I want you to bear that in mind. King Tut's skull is one of the most famous skulls for its quote-unquote peculiar head shape. King Tut's skull is one of the most famous long skulls probably in history. Everyone talks about King Tut's elongated skulls. People have even queried, was he human? Whereas we, you know, Africans just sit back and go, he just kind of looks like my cousin. <laughs> He's got a bit of a bean head. <laughs> yeah. No one in Africa is surprised by King Tut's head shape. Yet Europeans have to find out, is there something wrong with him? Remember, going back to what we looked at earlier, so if I just click here, flick on the back button. What are the causes of dolichocephalus? dolichocephaly in Europeans because we have specific causes um, where's that stuff about craniocytosis have I lost that uh. oh here we go sorry so it was here sorry causes causes craniocytosis or positioning these are the causes of dolichocephaly in Europeans. Okay, so I think we've drummed that topic now. Now let's get into the good stuff. Okay, so we've clear. Dolichocephaly, African trait, restricted to black people globally, even the ones that aren't necessarily recently African. So your Aboriginals or your um, Papua New Guineans, they also exhibit dolichocephaly, but they're all obviously politically classified as black people so something a trait that's only shared amongst black quote-unquote populations politically black populations i should say okay we know that no one's actually got black skin but you know that's the point i'm making and if it's exhibited in europeans it's a disability just like subnasal prognathism okay now let's go on to the good stuff our friend dr hawas i say that with your tongue in cheek okay i'm gonna can I zoom into this? I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. Bear with me. Because I want you to follow along with the deception here. If it allows me to. Okay, yes, yeah, so I've zoomed in a bit here. He carried out this study in 2010. And actually, I have to thank the people in the community for pointing me to this because I wasn't fully aware of this deception that's been taking place. Um, and someone pointed out to me and said, oh, King Tut's skull is classified as brachycephalic. I was like, are you insane? <laughs> Don't be stupid. I think I actually replied quite terse to them because I thought it was a, a Eurocentrist spam in my page because I get them often, you know, just chatting rubbish. I just kind of like replied, you, you know, you moron. Um, those of you know, like Eurocentrists, I'm, I'm quite unpolite to them. I don't have any patience for them. <laughs> I'm quite rude, um, deliberately so, because I don't want to feel welcome in my page. Um, whereas people who actually come there to learn or, you know, disagree without being Eurocentric about it, I'm probably a little bit more patient. But anyway, I was quite insulting to this person. And then I thought, let me go and have a look about what these studies say. So I found this study, which is probably the most famous study, is the Ancestry and Pathology in King Tutankhamun's Family. It's the same one that we get the DNA results from that we can then run through the STR um, profiling algorithms, which will cluster the pharaonic lineage amongst black Africans. So I bet he really regrets producing this study because <laughs> um, it's been used to kind of like disprove well, to prove the, the black Africanness of the ancient Egyptians. But let's just see how deceptive our friend Mr. Hawass can be. So I'm going to scroll down. Um, I know we've got the genetic results, but I want to kind of get us to the important parts, which is the skull. Cause that's what we're talking about today. There's so much to talk about, so much deception to talk about on this paper, but we can get there later. So these are the, oh, so these are the STR results that were used um, and these have been published in full, actually, that we can, you can run that test anytime. The beautiful thing about the STR results, just while I'm on that subject, is that now that they've been published, you can run that against any database anytime and it'll always give you the same result. So this is one of the things, when they try and give you these, oh, we have no idea what race the Egyptians were, but one of them carries this single marker and therefore they might be European. It's ridiculous because 
autosomal DNA testing will give you the whole genome. Okay, and that's what you have here with these STR or these short tandem repeats um, profiles. And you run them against databases and they say, based on where these kind of markers sit within the person's genome, they cluster most closely with this population and therefore they are most closely related to that population. It's the same way that they figure out if you're, you know, if, do, do they do paternity tests and figure out if you're someone's dad or not. They don't do it by running, seeing a single marker. They have to run your entire genome. These tests have been run for the entire pharaonic lineage for the New Kingdom and they've all come out more closely related to Southern Africans than any other population on the planet and that's specifically Southern Africans and then second the, the Africans of the Great Lakes region. So, you know, put that in your pipe and smoke it. But anyway, let's let's move on because I think this is quite important because I want you to get this deception. Mm. Excuse me, I will get there. I'm trying to wonder if I actually highlighted it because that will make it a lot easier. I feel like I did. <laughs> I hope I did because otherwise I'm going to have to read through all this again. I'm sure I did. Maybe when I zoomed in, I lost my highlighted text. I think I did. Okay, so I'm going to have to find it. If I let me just do a search. Bear with me. Um, control F. Let's look for Bre whoops. Brecky. There we go. All right, so let's read together. Have a look at this. So, one of the obvious features of Marfan syndrome is dolichocephaly. Look at this. So, remember what I said about when we have features that they don't exhibit, they will straight away call it a disability. So, they look for Marfan syndrome. With the exception of Yuya. Now, why, why would they even mention this? Why would they even mention this? Okay, because clearly there's an agenda at play here to kind of undermine the dolichocephaly within the pharaonic lineage. It says, with the exception of Yuya, now bear in mind, Yuya is the one that all the Eurocentrists try and claim. Yuya is the most extremely dolichocephalic out of everyone. He has a 0 0.7, but look, we haven't got there yet. None of the mummies of the Tetukama lineage had a cephalic, cephalic index of 75 or less. <laughs> so he's basically said, None of the mummies, including King Tut, who is famous for having the longest head, <laughs> one of the most famous long heads, one of the most famous bean heads in history, he's turned around and said that he has a he's not dolichocephalic. Okay, he said instead Akhenaten, and this is KV fifty five. I think he's talking about because we don't know for sure if it's Akhenaten, but KV fifty five has an index of eighty one, and Tutankhamun has an index of eighty four. Now, 84 is basically, don't take this any disrespect for where, that's basically an Asian head or a, a Ghanaian head. No disrespect. Like, that is, there is no way on earth King Tut has a cephalic index of 84. And I'm going to show proof of this as well. I'm not going to literally just say this to you. I'm going to show you multiple images proving that the cephalic index of King Tut is around 73, 72, based on which images you use. And I'm going to show proof. But the fact that Hawass would have the gall to publish that he has a cephalic index of 84, when he, the whole question mark and the whole kind of mystery around King Tut's skull is the longness of it. It's like the most famous elongated skull on the planet. And Hawass thinks he can just publish, oh, well, actually, we've just checked and he's actually got a round skull. Your, your eyes are lying to you. It's like, these people do not have any shame. It just shows you the complete lack of shame. So we're going to go through these skulls, okay? We're going to look at the allegedly brachycephalic skulls of King Tut and KV-55, which is believed to be Akhenaten. And we're going to see if any of this nonsense is true because we know that none of it is true but this is how desperate they'll come to so let's have a look at some images now together because i think it's important we now actually just touch on this subject so first of all let's start with well let's go back have a little bit of quick revision so how do we work out our cephalic index again very very simple to work out our cephalic index excuse me we just simply need to multi Divide the width of the skull across by the length of the skull. Okay, and that will give us the cephalic index. 
Okay, so can we work out the King Tut Cephalic Index with available images on the net? Absolutely. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you this image. Okay, this is the first one I'm going to show you. Brilliant, it's showing up nicely. Let me zoom in a bit here. Now, I've shown you this image to show you the fact that something dodgy is going on with King Tut. Now, if you was to play a game or spot the difference, I think most people would agree that these may not be the same mummy. Okay? In fact, I would go on to say they're not the same mummy. This is King Tut as he was exhumed. So this is the older version, the original King Tut. Now, I want you to have a look at the eyelids because this image was taken in 2023. And this image of King Tut, he has complete eyelids. This image, he has no eyelids. And this image, he has complete eyelids. Now, can any, anyone see a problem with this? Because that is very problematic. Let's have a look at the gold band as well. The gold band on his head is clearly quite high up in his forehead here. And you can barely make out that it's gold. If you look at the gold band in this image, it's moved down completely. Now... Did they add a gold band? Did they think he had didn't have enough gold? Someone else has also pointed out different noses. I was going to come on to that. Absolutely, they're different noses. And even if you look at the teeth, I mean, you could turn around and say, well, the teeth have been cleaned, but there's something very dodgy going on here. Has Are they showing kind of or exhibiting similar markings? Yes, they are, but these marks could have been added by artifice in order to make it match because the skin just looks altogether different. It looks a bit smoother. There's something dodgy going on with King Tut. Now, this isn't just kind of like me being a conspiracy theorist. I mean, well, if you're going to look at the fact that he's grown eyelids, that should be <laughs> a big enough red flag to you. But I'm going to show you some more differences that exist. And we're going to look at the cephalic index as well to show you how absolutely crazy Zai Hawass is. So let's move on. Next image I'm going to show you is this image. So this image will show you the original King Tut skull from front view. And because we are not given a top down view of King Tut skull, because obviously Mr. Hawass doesn't want you calculating the cephalic index of King Tut skull. I looked for scans, original scans, okay? I then made sure that they were scaled to exactly the same size. So I used a matrix to kind of make sure that the bottom of the nose is aligned, the teeth aligned. And obviously these two, which are the same, i.e. the original King Tut, show you that kind of nilotic looking African boy. These are from the same mummy. And then from here, working out the cephalic index is not very difficult. You can see I got the width of the skull from the front. Okay, so you can work out the width of the skull from the front. And obviously to be, you know, diplomatic about this, I made it a little bit wider from the front, given that, you know, you could maybe lose a tiny bit of depth depending on the lens that was used. So I made it a tiny bit wider. And I compared that to the width, or at least the length of the skull from the front of the forehead to the back of the skull. Now, based upon these measurements, we have a cephalic index of 0.73 or 73%. That's 10% out from Hawass's measurement of 84, 11% out because his measurement was 84%. And just to show you how significant that difference is, this green line here is where his skull should sit with Hawass's measurement. So if we go by Hawass's cephalic index, that is where Hawass is saying his skull ends to get a cephalic index of 84. So do you understand the depths of deception that are taking place for Hawass to boldly proclaim that King Tut, the literally the most known elongated skull, probably in history, actually doesn't have an elongated skull, he has a square skull and he's brachycephalic. Can you believe the audacity of these people? 
So I want you to bear that in mind. Let's move on to the next image. Okay, the next image, I found two different scans of Tut Skull because I didn't want to do this just once. I wanted to do it on multiple occasions and see if I got the same result. Once again, this is a scan, an early scan from Tut Skull. I got the width from this back view. Okay, and I got the length from a side view once again ran the cephalic index and we have a 74% cephalic index. Okay, same result, different set of scans. Let's move on. Do we have any more corroborating evidence to suggest that? Well, I even ran it against this God awful reconstruction. <laughs> So I ran it against this god awful reconstruction. Now this one, I couldn't get obviously fully accurate based on the fact that it's been built up. So, but even running it against this god awful reconstruction that was done, which wouldn't have been, which they probably would have mildly kind of like hidden certain features like his dolichocephaly in order to kind of get it passed in the general public, still managed to run a cephalic index of 0.757 way off Hawass's 0.84 or 84%. Let's have another look from another angle. Okay. Now, actually, no, we'll come on to this one. Now, here's what's quite important. In 2023, the same place that I found this image, so the same place that I found this image, they published these photos of King Tut's skull. And instantly when I saw these photos, I was like, that doesn't look like King Tut's skull. <laughs> what's going on here? This is, what's going on? This doesn't look like King Tut's skull. It looked wider from the front and it looked rounder from the side. And straight away, I was like, there's something dodgy going on. I like this doesn't look like King Tut's skull. I also noticed that we have these massive protruding bones coming from the neck. And I'm, I'm very familiar with King Tut's kind of, you know, skeleton. And he doesn't have these massive bones protruding from the neck. But yet this is what was published as being the latest scan of King Tut's skull. So anyway, I ran the cephalic index on this one. And even this one came up at 0.79 or 79%, which is not, which is no longer dolichocephalic, but still mesocephalic, but well outside of King Tut's original skull. So I thought, okay, well, let me not jump to conclusions. Let me run a comparison of this with the original scans, because maybe it just looks a bit different without, you know, the flesh and whatnot being on it. So I overlaid this scan, which they're giving the general public now as being the shape of King Tut's skull against the original scans. And let me show you what I came up with. So this is what happened when I ran it against the original images. I used this one as my basis and you can see the head on the new skull is clearly wider on both sides, or you can't really see it that clearly. You'll see it more clear in the next image, but more Disturbingly, you can see differences between where the back of the skull is here and the back of the skull is here and those bones sticking out of the neck, like I mentioned. I had to reshape this one because it didn't fit. It was so way out of proportion. In order to make the teeth line up, I had to reshape it. And even when it was reshaped, the cephalic index was still sitting at 0.74 and 0.76. Now, I'm going to show you some of those differences a little bit more pronounced here, so you can see them. So the blue line is King Tut's original skull. You can see it there. So the blue line, and you can see that white line giving us the length of that skull. And then the red line is the new skull. Now you'll notice, not only is it much shorter, but also, you'll notice there's a protrusion of this bone. You can't grow new bone beyond the back. So you can see there's these marked differences between what's being presented as the skull of King Tut and what was formerly presented as the skull of King Tut. Something odd is going on. I've done an overlay of the two of them here for you to see some of these differences. So I'm just going to zoom in here to this image. 
look at the differences there. So you can see there's differences here in the height. There's differences. It's flatter at the top now, essentially. It's much shorter. It's much rounder, or at least much deeper than it used to be. I mean, that is significant. That's about an inch in difference. And then we have about half an inch to an inch worth of protrusion on the neck. This is just not the same skull. So either we have a very inaccurate scan that's been published and being publicised, or we have some kind of swapping that's taken place. But either which way, someone needs to be questioning the Egyptian antiquities on this deception, because this is just not on. This is a completely different skull. Now, I want to show you just really quickly as well the comparison of Hawass's results and the actual skull of King Tut. So these three images show you what he would have needed to have done to obtain a cephalic index of 0.83. So even here with the skull tilted slightly, I always mention the fact that they tilt the skull as a way of kind of getting the results they want. So over here with the t skull slightly tilted, we only have a cephalic index of 0.73, still strongly dolichocephalic as it is. And that's with it tilted. Tilted, this is near enough 45 degrees. Tilted 45 degrees, and we still have a cephalic index of 0.795. You have to tilt the skull pretty much around 95 to 100 degrees and angle your camera, you can see with the green lines, to get a, a cephalic reading of 0.83. You have to literally take a photo of the back of his head. <laughs> That's the lengths that you have to go to. That is literally the lengths that you have to go to to create this kind of deception. So, just to be clear, Hawass is lying. When he says that King Tut is brachycephalic, this, uh, this is the kind of mental and physical gymnastics you have to do to make King Tut's very clearly, visibly dolichocephalic skull brachycephalic. I want to show you one more as well. Have a look here. This is Akhenaten or KV55, which they said was also brachycephalic. Cephalic index of 0.74 or 74%. Clearly not brachycephalic, still dolichocephalic. So there's clearly quite a lot of deception taking place. There is really quite a lot of deception that is taking place in Egyptology at the moment. As you, well, I mean, you're going to be very aware of that, but you can see here, they're not. there's no effort here to play fair. It's not even a case of just saying, okay, this is a cephalic index and we're going to make up a load of crap about why they've got, you know, dolichocephaly. They're actually going to turn around and tell you, no, they don't have dolichocephaly. And this is why when people make claims like, you know, oh, they couldn't have broken the noses of the statues or they wouldn't do this and they wouldn't do that. This to me proves, actually, they'll do just about anything. They really do not care. They literally really do not care. They will literally do anything to distort the truth and to move ancient Egypt out of Africa and away from melanated people. It's unbelievable the lengths that they'll go through. I want to take you back to the paper really quickly because there was something that I missed that I wanted to highlight to you that was really quite important. So if I go back to the paper again, and I'm going to talk about... Um, one moment. Whoops. So remember earlier when we were having a look through and we were looking at causes, primary causes of dolichocephaly. We'll have a look here. Let's have a quick read through because this is quite, quite interesting. So let's have a quick look. Specific diseases that have been suggested to explain the appearance of Marf include Marfan syndrome. So remember, we've already established that the Marfan syndrome is to explain away the dolichocephaly. 
Wilson Turner X linked mental retardation syndrome, Frolic syndrome, Kleinfelter syndrome, androgen insensitivity syndrome, aromatase excess syndrome in conjunction with sagittal craniocyanostosis syndrome. Another one to just check why do they have dolicocephalic skulls? However, most of the disease diagnoses are hypothetical, derived by observing and interpreting artifacts. So they're even admitting the only reason we think they've got these is because they're carrying traits that really aren't carried outside of black Africa. So we have to find some kind of a way of explaining it away. Remember, our unique traits are disabilities to them. That's something that we have to be very, very aware of. Our unique traits are disabilities. They'll tell you that melanin, you know, extreme, you know, extreme melanin is a problem as opposed to melanin deficiency. They'll tell you that subnasal prognathism is a disability of the lower jawline. They'll tell you that dolicocephaly is a disability of the shape of the head. All of these things are exhibited naturally amongst black Africans, but because we are the only ones that exhibit them, they become disabilities. It's really important to remember that. And not by evaluating the mummified remains of royal individuals apart from these artifacts. So they've admitted there. So they tested for all of these diseases. None of these diseases were found, as we know. So then the only conclusion should be, well, they must be like the surrounding people who have subnasal prognathism, who have dark skin and who have dolicocephaly. Will they ever admit that? No. So the next best thing was to outright deny the fact that they were dolicocephalic altogether, which is exactly what they did. It's interesting the lengths they'll go to, isn't it? I'm going to try and get back on, a, <laughs> on some of these comments, um, see if you guys are following along, because I was kind of into that. Um, I just, I'm just going to ask if it's read if anyone's actually asked any questions that I think I can add. Um, studies have shown King Tut's genetic match African countries. Yep, very aware of that. Um, Hawass is Aida. <laughs> well, it actually says Hawass, my man, but yeah, he's he, the dude's the dude's a nutcase. Um, I want to see if there's any any questions here. Sorry, can't I'm not I can't read all of the comments because as, as you can imagine, there's quite a lot. People being freaked out, I can imagine. It's very it's it's very deep the kind of lengths that they go through. Impressive presentation. I'm glad you enjoyed that. It was quite like I said, it was quite an in-depth one, um, and I wasn't feeling super um, prepared for it, but I guess it was quite interesting. Um, King Tut was in a poor state when I saw it over ten years ago, and there were concerns that it was degrading. Yeah, so I guess they swapped it, maybe. Has anyone mentioned the so-called anemic child mummies that were recently analysed? I will check those out. Okay. I say it's the only disease found in Tut was malaria. And in Africa, almost every healthy person in the endemic region is carrying malaria. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that contribution. All right, so... I'm trying to think of those, some other things that I wanted to touch on in this live stream. I think I touched on most things. There was quite a few different sources that I was going to take you through, but I think what we covered was probably deep enough. We don't really need to go into much more detail than that. I think that hopefully the subject of dolicocephaly now is kind of clear to everybody, is that we carry it at a very high rate in Africa. It's by no means universal. We also have brachycephalic and mesocephalic people within Africa, but we're the only ones who exhibit dolicocephaly without disability. So that's really important to note. And I, I do want you to kind of go away and sleep on the fact that ancient Europeans, or I should say early Europeans, were all dolicocephalic and many of them had subnasal prognathism. And it's European historians that need to explain that away, European anthropologists, because... If all modern populations are reflective of ancient populations, then only politically 
black people are capable of dolichocephaly. And if you have the combination of dolichocephaly and subnasal prognathism, that is almost a home run, definitely a black African or at least a black person. <laughs> so they have to explain that away. They can't just kind of put that away and go, you know, what their approach to this data is, is to just turn around and say, oh, well, you know, the, the ancient Aryans were a dolichocephalic subnasal prognathism people. Well, what happened to them? What happened to them? Explain that. Tell, tell everybody what happened to these ancient Aryans. Why did, why did their skulls disappear? And wh why are we left with brachycephalic skulls? Was there some huge kind of, you know, cataclysm like Pompeii? where you know all of your heads were flattened <laughs> it's not a satisfactory answer okay it's not a satisfactory answer a satisfactory answer would be where do we see these traits exhibited at the same rate let's look at that population because that's probably what these people look like so anyway that's another one i'm not going to touch on europe too much i just want to touch on ancient egypt i think we've kind of hit the subject um i could go into biology a bit further but i just wanted to focus on that subject i hope it's kind of like was meaningful for everyone hit the likes up please do i've um, got 71 likes please hit the likes up as much as possible um i'm gonna stay on for a little bit feel free to ask me well i don't say ask me some questions but you know feel free to engage me in conversation because i think it's quite good for us to have these discussions i haven't been on, on online for a while <laughs> i've missed it i'm not gonna lie um so you know yeah let, let's let's stay on for a little bit before i disappear so i'm gonna go through a few of these comments by the eye of horace you found something i think so too um the protrusion means distance between the neck and skull base is smaller neck and skull base yes i did notice that between the two skulls of tutu carmen um they're hot they're all hiding in atlantis oh here, that's another subject i'm, I'm going to touch on soon atlantis was in africa i don't know if anyone has had a look or done some research into the the recart structure someone put me onto that i love this that's why one one of the reasons i love this community is because people put me onto so much i obviously you know do my own research and publish as much as I can but sometimes the community just provide me with so much valuable info and I'm I'm so willing to obviously listen and to learn new things so um I'm 90% sure that the Reichardt structure um which is called the, I think the eye of Mauritania have a have a look with a bit of research into that a lot there's some good research out there suggesting that that was the um, that was where Atlantis was situated based on the descriptions by Herodotus. And there's a YouTuber who's done some really good research in that area. Um, I can't remember exactly what his name is. Um, it's a white YouTuber. He's really good. Um, so do try and find his channel. Um, it's quite interesting. Um, and here's another interesting thing. I actually, this is some original research that I actually want to get into. I actually believe the Great Great Wall of Benin, I'm not sure if everyone's heard of that, but the Great Wall of Benin, I believe that that may have been an attempt at building a new Atlantis because I've just started my research on that, but I think the dimensions of the Great Wall of Benin are quite similar to the first, to the first, um, I want to say circle. I'm sure there's a better word than circle. <laughs> to the first circle of the um, eye of Mauritania or the recast structure. And I think the Benin Empire were on their way to rebuilding something similar to the um, to the city of Atlantis um, prior to obviously it being totally destroyed. But it's worthwhile. That's, that's, that's a bit of research that I'd, I think I'd love to get into. Um, thank you, Jay Hood. Um, he said, phenomenal presentation breakdown. Once again, King, definitely appreciate your dedication. You display of your information you always provide that debunks the many inaccurate lies they run with. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate the words. I, I love the encouragement I get from the community. Um, like I said, I've really missed being live. I'm glad to have a semi-decent internet connection to be able to have these discussions with you guys again. Um, but yeah, 
I think I'm not sure, but I think I think I think we're gonna wrap it up there. It's kind of like I feel like we could go on for a bit, but I haven't I haven't prepared much more than that. In fact, actually, before I go, I think it's really important to note where I've been because <laughs> it's been a little bit of a while since I've kind of like I've, it feels like I've been a little bit lost. I've got a lot that's kind of in the offing at the moment. I've done a lot of research. I did mention at the start of the stream, I've got a lot of new books. And yeah, I did overwhelm myself slightly, but I've got loads and loads of kind of like semi-complete content that I just have to find the time to kind of complete and get it out there to everyone. So please just bear with me. Um, I'm edging closer and closer to being able to do this full time. So obviously the, the 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 biggest thing you can do for me is, you know, hit the subscribe button if you're not subscribed already, share this page, get more people to subscribe to it. Cause when I hit critical mass, uh, and I'm and I know I'm at a stage where I can kind of support myself. Then you're gonna see much more content come from me. Um, but at the moment, obviously, you have to pay them bills, baby. You know how it goes. Um, Benin fits the description of what Atlantis was, but smaller. Yeah, so I feel quite similar to that as well. I feel like there's, I almost feel like there's there was a. I feel like Atlantis was the kind of like precursor to the civilizations that came later, and I feel like it kind of fed in to a lot of what took place along the Sahel, as well as to the Nile Valley region. So I don't, I know a lot of people kind of believe that like a lot of it kind of emanated from Egypt and then you had this kind of huge migration. I actually, I'm not of that belief. I believe that obviously there some migrations took place, but I also kind of believe there were multiple kind of origin points and Kemet or, you know, ancient Egypt was the result of many of these kind of earlier civilizations, some of which fed directly into, you know, different parts of Africa. And so the shared names could be older. The shared cultures could be older than ancient Kemet, as opposed to Kemet being the source point for a lot of the things that took place. I believe that many of them are older. Um, but the idea that the, the, the whole kind of, yeah, the whole idea is that there's a shared origin or shared multiple origins across Africa, um, which resulted in multiple civilizations doing different things. Can you talk briefly on Roman arts, color, symbology? I wish I could. <laughs> I haven't got huge amount on Roman colors. Um, I know that the Greeks, for instance, all of the Greek gods were depicted as black, um, but the Greeks weren't ashamed of the fact that they worship black gods. It's quite <laughs> they're quite open with that. Um, and it's, it's funny. I, I went to I went back to a book recently called Black Athena that I had picked up a few years ago, and I put down and I picked it up again. A really good book by Martin Bernal. Um, it's essentially about the fact that there are different models we have kind of an ancient model and then we have a, a western model and the ancient model is the kind of model of history that history followed for thousands of years where essentially civilization started in africa started with kush moved on to kemet moved on to greece moved on to rome so forth in that order but then the western model came along and you know obviously the westerners had to justify racism and slavery and kind of the the indignant way in which they were treating melanated people across the world so they had to scrap the ancient model couldn't work anymore and that's essentially what we follow now we follow the western model where they essentially broke it and said africa had nothing to do greece created everything even the books that were clearly translated from africa texts like the hermetica <laughs> you know greece created everything by itself without any help from africans because it has to you know, they, they, they just can't bring themselves to ever admit that Africa came first. Um, let's have a look. Um, Atlantis is fictional. I don't think so. I know someone said Atlantis is fictional, but I actually, I think my, my kind of point of view is if something is spoken about um, by multiple civilizations, then it probably existed. That's that's kind of my my perception our understanding of Atlantis certainly may be fictional, but I don't think it's, 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 it's existence was, you know, if we didn't have the pyramids and people didn't start excavating ancient Egypt, 
would probably believe Kemet was fictional, you know. Um, but it's just that we have the, the evidence here in front of us that it becomes something that's kind of real and tangible. So, I mean, um, you're welcome to believe it's fictional. I think a lot of the, the reason we are probably lean towards it being fictional is because of the way it's been romanticized and where it's been taken out of context. But I just see it as a, another civilization, another African civilization that predates Kemet. Um, but yeah, um, you're welcome to believe that. I don't have evidence, so you could very well be right and I could be wrong, <laughs> you know. Uh, do you have any information on Nazlik Keitar, man found near Tata, Egypt, 35,000 BC? Is this still the oldest skull found in Egypt? I saw that, I saw that reconstruction as well. Um, you know, <sighs> I'm I'm very dubious about reconstructions of skulls, particularly of ones not done. I mean, even though it does look African, a lot of people turn around and say, I mean, I look at it and it looks just like a Southern African. It looks so Southern African, it's amazing. But even so, I still take it with a pinch of salt because I know there's just no way. You could give them, you could literally give them the skull of, <laughs> I try to think of someone. You know, yeah, you could give them the, 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 the skull of, you know, Jimon, Who's that actor, Jimon Husson or something like that? You give them his skull and they'd still manage to to build a white man out of it. You know, that's just the way they are. You know, there's just no, there's, you know, it's just, it's very difficult. Can you do a video on Nubian artwork, brother? Um, I intend to. I'm going to go into Nubia quite a lot. I'm actually working with a, a Nubian kind of content creator at the moment who's helping me with research and we're planning on putting something together. The subject on Nubia I'm being very delicate with because it was one of the kind of subjects that when I got into this entire topic really, not I wouldn't just say touched my heart, but really kind of like spoke to me. The sadness that I felt when, you know, the building of Lake NASA, and this is even before I knew the, fully the effect it had on the Nubian people, just the way that they so you know so ruthlessly flooded african antiquities and just decided they were just gonna flood all evidence of you know or a large amount of the evidence of you know african antiquities that they probably had loads of loads probably more than what we see in ancient egypt and they just thought we need to get rid of this and they just decided they're gonna build a dam and just flood it all and obviously the part i didn't see was the fact that so many nubian people lost their way of life and lost their connection to Kemet in that time. And it's there's a lot of there've been a lot of Nubian people who've kind of opened my eyes to the the damage that that caused. So I want to do some work in the Nubian kind of community and on the on the subject of you know ancient Nubia. But it's one that I have to kind of tread very carefully with and make sure that I do the the, the subject justice. You know. Um, Atlantis wasn't magical, it was old black and in Africa. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, even when you look at a savage African group, there is sociology that shows elements of a precursor society. One guy described it as noble at the core. Yeah, I mean, what do you, yeah, what do you call it? I know you meant to put savage in um, inverted commas there, um, Wesker Willie. I know you did. Because there is no savage African community or African group, is there? There's just elements of tribal and ethnic society that people don't understand. And this is one of the biggest things they've tried to... The, the irony is, I'm doing a video literally right now, I'm working on the video, is they like to write, you know, ancient Egypt is the biggest kind of most romanticised African tribe there is. You know, you can't escape the tribalism of ancient Kemet. It's literally just mirrors African tribalism to this day. It's literally at its core, take away the statues and all of the, the, the rich kind of cultural aspect of ancient Kemet. At its core, it's just the most tribal African society you're going to come across. You know, look at all the images of the ancient, you know, Egyptians, the way they dressed, you know, the the traditions, the, the dancing virgins, which has obviously been preserved in, you know, Southern Africa, the, you know, the, the, um, the presentation of the, 
warriors and the Magi, the the fact that they were always barefoot, yeah. <laughs> I think King Tut was the only one probably wore slippers in 4,000 years. <laughs> you know, these were just a, a standard basic African tribe and they romanticise that at the same time they want to turn around and call our other tribes savage. It's like, no, I'm not having that. I'm not having that. You have to accept our culture as it is and as it's presented. I'm very happy to have you there, the soul of our ancestors. He said, I'm happy to finally catch a live session. I'm very happy to catch you too. Um, fact question. King Monolog, do you have an archaeological background? Do you have degree in a particular area of study? I got into an argument with someone about the work you've done with recreations. My answer is I do have a degree. I also have a postgraduate in education. Um, none of which are in archaeology. I have a degree in education, so I'm qualified to teach. Um, but I kind of don't think you need one. Um, there's not really a subject that I've, at least from what I can see, that, that I've broached that you can't reach the same conclusion with common sense. So it's kind of like the, the analogy I give people is, you know, it's similar to when you watch the news. You can sit and watch the news and sit and listen to an expert lie to you <laughs> about something that you know the answer to or you can exercise a bit of common sense and actually the people who often tell you the truth maybe aren't the ones who are qualified in the area and I could give you a million examples of that but it's kind of up to you if and I'm obviously not speaking to you personally right now but kind of in general how you decide to consume information so I always say people don't don't listen to me listen to the the information or the data I pass you if Zari Hawass, who is a qualified, you know, qualified archaeologist or whatever you want to call him, will sit there and tell you King Tut's cephalic index is 84. And then I show you pictures calculating his cephalic index on multiple vertices and clearly it never exceeds 75. Then whose degrees at work? <laughs> That's the question there, you know. Horace just said you don't need one to see common sense. I totally agree. You know, um, and that's what it's all about. It's a, you know, having access to information gives you the ability to be able to, you know, touch on these subjects without really much, much difficulty. Um, and that being said, also being humble enough to be corrected when you're wrong and to see where you can, you know, improve your knowledge in areas where you perhaps haven't attacked the subject correctly I have Black Athena I recommend you get and read through all the books by Mufundishi I'm not even going to try and pronounce that name I don't want to disrespect it <laughs> I'll check out Leo because you never give me bad advice um, RJ McKenzie Disney did a movie on Atlantis back in 2001 and the people were dark is there a hidden message? I hate Disney. And I do use the word hate. <laughs> I know it's a strong word, but I really do. I hate Disney as a company. Um, I think they're absolutely foul. Um, that being said, I don't think they're... I think there's actually a worldwide... I think there's a deliberate uncovering taking place. I don't think it's an accident. So, for instance, the whole timing of the Netflix kind of like thing, people will say, oh, it's the work agenda. It's got nothing to do with that. I think they've just decided they're going to uncover things. So at the moment in the UK, they've got, they've got a uh, documentary on Anne Boleyn. Now, Anne Boleyn was the mother of Queen Elizabeth I, one of King Henry VIII's wife. And she's been depicted as black in this documentary. And it's got people in uproar, particularly, you know, those who are kind of of the, you know, conservative viewpoint. Oh, how dare you do her black? Blah, 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 blah. Here's the interesting thing. If you read the early descriptions and when I say early I mean contemporaneous descriptions of Anne Boleyn she's almost solely described as swarthy now if you look at the dictionary definition of swarthy back in the 1800s it's basically my complexion it's very very black skinned now that's going to shock a few people but they didn't just pull out this Anne Boleyn documentary and this Cleopatra documentary just to rile people up. You know, shows like Bridgerton that have come out recently, I believe there's kind of something happening where they want people to be aware of history. They kind of want to 
semi-release it. You know, it's this whole idea of things being hidden in plain sight. They want people to start to kind of, un- you know, to question what they've been taught. Because I'm telling you right now, if you knew the history of Britain, for instance, you would be shocked. Shocked beyond belief. It's not as black and white as people think it is. Well, it is. <laughs> That's the point. It's not as white and white as people think it is. So, yeah, it's very, very, very interesting. Um, so, yeah, that's just to kind of answer that point about Disney's movie on Atlantis. I think there's there's a deliberate kind of like uncovering taking place at the moment. So, yeah, there you go. Um, these days, people, um, you don't need to see comments. Yeah, yeah. Uh, these days, people need to use critical thinking. I agree. I make a lot of memes compiling imagery of Kemet and African culture today. Very virtually educative. Oh, by the way, send me that, Whisker, because when I do my video, I'm going to do a little bit of a documentary on that whole kind of like Kemet, ancient Kemet versus African culture. And I want to make sure I touch on everything because I think that'll be a really cool, like short documentary. I think I'll probably do that next. I'm kind of in the midst of doing that. So feel free to share that with me. Oh, no, let's be clear. I have no problem with the work you've done. I've done my research and I agree with your findings. Thanks, um, McFact. Um, I didn't think you were being accusatory, by the way. Um, seven of 21 child mummies from Egypt had anemia, sickle cell anemia. King Tut almost surely had sickle cell and malaria, apparently. So he was like super African. <laughs> Benin, to be exact. Um, Queen Charlotte was black. Yeah, not the only one. Not the only one. One of many. I want to. What I say, I want to. I want to keep going on that topic, but I'm not going to, because this is not the time, not the place. Um, so I'm just reading at the moment. Seeing this, ancient and modern Britons. Interesting. I want to know what the rest of that comment is. The UK has a messy history. Very. Um, I heard Akhenaten destroyed the gods' faces, statues, because. His one God worship only. I heard that he in he kind of started the worship of one God, or at least introduced the idea of kind of monotheism, and as a result, they destroyed the faces of his statues when he died, um, and reinstated kind of like the well. We have to be careful about the word, the use of the word worship as well, because the ancient Egyptian or the ancient Kemetic faith was not a dogmatic faith so a lot of what we classify as worship was personification and metaphor and it was ways of kind of understanding naturalistic concepts so a lot of it goes over our head we kind of have this idea that they just sat there kind of like well we worship you Ra, we were. and that kind of wasn't comedic society it was very much a society of understanding when you read the kind of um, positive confessions of Mahat and, you know, the book of coming forth by day. It was all based on kind of um, the human responsibility as opposed to the need to worship an external entity. Most of it was based on human responsibility and our, one of our greatest un- responsibilities is to understand as much about nature as possible and it was through kind of observing and looking upon the gods i say in quoted comma or the netters the nature the word nature comes from the word netter as i'm sure or netter as i'm sure many of you are already aware that's where we get the modern word nature from in order to understand nature we had to understand the natures that we were surrounded by and each Netter represented a different nature or a different aspect of nature. And bear in mind the words science and nature are interchangeable. So the words science and nature are interchangeable. So if you understand nature, you understand science. If you understand science, you understand nature. So we have to be quite careful. Well, at least I say we have to be. You don't have to be because you might not see it that way. In my view, I'm always quite careful in not putting a my modern dogmatic view of religion on the ancient societies because I don't think they were dogmatic in that, in that kind of perspective. Were there more urban cities in ancient Egypt than villages? I don't think so. 
Well, at least there's no evidence of that. But it'll be interesting to see what's excavated. There's it, it, there's actually, I wouldn't say shocking little, but there's not. We haven't got huge amounts of evidence of kind of like city style urbanization in Kemet. So we kind of have the large temples and the pantheons and all the kind of these different areas um, that were set aside for specific purposes. But it's been, it's been, there's been shockingly kind of little uncovered in terms of the, the life of the kind of everyday Egyptian in terms of like how they, you know, their, their dwelling places. Um, they found dwelling places of, you know, people like the pyramid builders, but they were, they were given very good <laughs> dwelling places. They were very highly regarded in society. So yeah, it's quite interesting. Yeah, keep the lights coming. Thank you very much. 103 in the chat and 99 likes. Come on, dudes. What's going on? <laughs> I also heard that many of us... Uh, let's have a look. I have a theory on African spirituality structure and how it accommodated every aspect of life and how European power structure couldn't copy that precisely. So I tried to suppress that what was considered interesting. Very, very interested to hear, hear more on that. Queen Charlotte was not black, but it's believed she had black ancestry. She was probably one quarter, one eighth, or three quarters, or seven eighth white. Well, that depends on what your understanding is. If you believe that all of the British royal lineage were all white before Queen Charlotte and all white after her, then you're very welcome to believe that. Who am I to tell you otherwise? Outside the religious power. Okay, so, you know what? I kind of feel like we're going to wrap it up now. It's half past 10 over here. And I don't want to get to the stage where I'm waffling. I kind of feel like I'm waffling a bit now. So thank you, everyone, for joining. You guys are the best. I've actually really enjoyed this. I hope the subject kind of hit home. And yeah, get at me in the comments. You know how it goes. Hit the like button up. Share this out as much as possible. And yeah, get at me because I'm going to go live, hopefully within the next week again um, on a different subject and feel free to kind of like recommend subjects that we can discuss. I've really enjoyed this, um, but I'm going to call it a day now because I'm tired. I need to go eat. So um, thank you. Um, keep the comments coming. I'll check out the chat. If not immediately, I've, I've read for most of it already. I will read it back. I do allow the chat to kind of be regenerative so you can go back and watch it and it will show you the live chat appear as the kind of the day or at least as the kind of session went on so yeah write stuff in the chat i will get at it and i appreciate you i appreciate everyone and i will see you all in a bit thank you thank you guys take care peace